I don't think there's any risk of there being some instantaneous singularity in which computers are suddenly going to take over. Do I think that machines will soon match their makers? No. Do I think that someday they could? Yeah. We know that machines can do everything that brains can do because the brain is a machine. The question is, will machines soon match their makers? Um, or, or is it science fiction hype? Um, and will a real AI remain uh, elusive? Because perhaps we've uh, misunderstood the nature both of what thought is and what machines are. So to help us um, discuss this topic, we have on my right, Hilary Lawson. Uh, Hilary's a non-realist philosopher. Kate Devlin, senior lecturer at Goldsmith's Department of Computing. Uh, and she works in the fields of human computer interaction and artificial intelligence. Uh, and um, uh, David Chalmers, Chalmers, sorry, formulator of the hard problem of consciousness, which then everybody talked about for decades and still do. Philosopher of mind is the author of The Singularity. Um, Hilary, would you, would you start us off, please? We've, um, we've always been rather over-impressed with what uh, computers can do, from you know, the cracking of the Enigma codes to uh, beating us at chess. And uh, as a result, we somehow imagine that they're going to be uh, take over all, all of the things that we can do, uh, which uh, I'd say I'm going to argue is an illusion. Uh, we just have to remind ourselves of what they failed to do. I mean, 50 years ago in the film 2001, we had the character of Hal, um, who was running the ship, who took over the ship and malevolently operated against uh, humans. And of course, we are nowhere near a computer being able to do that, and we've long since passed 2001. So um, uh, computers have not lived up to what we uh, thought they, that they might do. Uh, and more than that, they're not even able to do the sort of things that a two-year-old child we take for granted could do. So no computer can identify any object um, it, it, that is in the world. Uh, the only way we've been able to get computers to identify objects is to tell them that they're choosing between, say, five objects, like a cup and a saucer and a mug or whatever, and they're presented in just the right distance from the camera and separated in a reasonable fashion, and uh, then it can just about uh, distinguish the cup from the saucer. But if you actually put it in a real-world situation, and the computer's not able to identify it. And if we can't identify, if computers can't identify the objects or objects in the world, then how could they possibly make any judgments about how to interact and, uh, and, and uh, m make judgments about what to do? I think underlying that, there is a problem that uh, computer scientists have adopted the same sort of overall common sense framework that most of us adopt, which is that we imagine that the world is already divided into things and all that we are engaged in doing is identifying those things. So I don't think that is what's going on. I think we hold the world as things. So our, our senses are not mirrors to the world. They don't show us what the world is. What they do is they respond to the world. They're causal responses. <coughs> They're like flags in the wind or bells in the wind. We have to uh, hold the world as things and not the same thing as what's out there. We have to hold it as things in order to be able to intervene. So I think that computer science would have to do exactly the same thing. Now, it has done so to some degree. So Igor Alexander, 30 years ago, developed a computer program which was able to identify different faces and rather remarkably could, could, could uh, distinguish between a thousand faces uh, rather better than, than humans could do. But it didn't do this by identifying the same things that we do, like the eyes and the nose and the mouth. It just said, is this the same image as the one that I've seen previously? And if it was the same, it would say, call that A. And if it was not the same, it would call it B, and it would gradually increase the number until it had a sense of all of the different faces. So I think we could build an intelligent machine that would make its own categories and its own distinctions uh, and be able, indeed, potentially to be able to intervene. But if we did such a thing and it was born tomorrow, <coughs> it would 
be a lot worse than the two-year-old baby. It, would ha it wouldn't have the advantages of a couple of million years of evolution and all of the advantages we've got in creating our closures. And we would then have to train it. So I don't think there's any risk of there being some uh, frightening uh, instantaneous singularity in which computers are suddenly going to take over. We're going to have to train them and it would take uh, an immensely long time for us, first of all, to develop a machine which will do that, and then for us to be able to train it and get it to a state where it could intervene sensibly. Do I think that machines will soon match their makers? No. Do I think that someday they could? Yeah. Um, and I think there's a couple of things you mentioned at the start about Alan Turing saying well, we're going to soon whatever it was, 30, 50 years we're going to have, from when he wrote his paper, um, said, yes, we're going to have this. Turin in the same paper also devised a test for extracentric perception. Now, I'm not denigrating Turing in the slightest, but just that's not come about either. So I think, we've, you know, the, the man was a genius at the start of the competing revolution. Um, the reason I think, I mean, it's, it's reasons that we're all probably going to have in common as to why we think that it's not going to happen soon. Um, we... <laughs> We expect um, that if a machine wants to match its makers, we would want it to have some kind of awareness, <laughs> some kind of sentience that rivals ours, that is on a par with ours. And there are different approaches to that in AI. There is the approach where we have, um, we have somehow replicated the human brain. And there are projects where people are trying to do this, they're trying to model the human brain. I don't think that's a particularly effective way of doing it. The other one is to have human-like computing, where we have machines that react in the same way that we might expect. They behave like a human, but there's other stuff going behind the scenes. Like Hillary says, it can identify things in a different way. Um, now, the bit that I disagree with Hillary is about the training, because I think if we create a machine that is that does have this level of intelligence, there's no reason why it has to go through a, tra a training series that will last a long time. This could be something that very rapidly uh, the technology develops uh, and learns. Um, I think at the moment, technology, uh, computers, robotics, all that sort of stuff, they're designed for very individual, narrow tasks. So in AlphaGo recently, AlphaGo beat the champion Go player. We didn't think that would happen for at least another 10 years. Okay, that, was, that was a groundbreaking thing for a computer to beat a Go player. The problem with that is AlphaGo is rubbish at Pictionary, right? You don't want to, they don't want to go up against it, you know, they won't want to go up against you. Um, we could train a robot to be really good at Pictionary, okay, that, that's doable. Um, and there are people working on all sides of uh, computers creating art, um, computers that are com machines that are companions to us. We have care robots out there right now, um, looking after people, people form attachments with them. But, they're all for very specific and narrow tasks. So I think that while someday, given the technology and the time, you can say this about pretty much any computational challenge, given the right technology, given an infinite number of time, given some monkeys typing Shakespeare on a series of infinite typewriters, we could, we could come up with this, we could solve this problem. But um, right now, it's not going to happen anytime soon. I think the things we have to worry about right now with artificial intelligence are much more prosaic things. Um, things like the influence that they're having on the world and on society. But one of those things, you know, those things are not a machine uprising, I don't think. So our topic then is uh, what machines can't do. And I guess the thought is to contrast what uh, machines can or can't do with what we can or can't do with our, uh, with our human brains. My thought is maybe there are some things that brains can do that machines can't do. Now, the moment you put it that way, I think there's something slightly wrong with the framing, because we know that machines can do everything that brains can do. Why? Because the brain is a machine. The brain is itself a big, complicated machine with a whole bunch of physical mechanisms interacting, producing, uh, producing behavior. So I guess the question really is something like not what machines can't do, but what artificial machines can't do. Maybe artificial machines will be limited, or maybe what computational machines can't do, or programmed machines can't do. And the thought is maybe there are things that brains can do that programmed or artificial machines can't do.